Howdy hackers and welcome to another episode of Fairlight TV. Yeah, I've started coding here and uh, it seems that um, your appreciation for that like basic coding is a lot more uh, than my sort of deep dive into the technical gory details. So yeah, why not add a bit more of that? And uh, again, this is not going to be a ping pong between me and not the wizard, uh, but I saw a few of his uh, additional videos where he's doing stuff and uh, I felt an urge to <laughs> sort of add additional aspects to uh, to coding. So uh, what you will have now is uh, me looking at uh, a few of the aspects of coding and, and we will go through like coding on a line per line, line basis and uh, like a description of why I'm doing what I'm doing. And uh, again, I'm not a professional coder. So if you find that my coding and my formatting of, of what I do is totally ugly. Feel free to do your own video and I don't want comments on my code style. If there are bugs, I'm happy to, to kind of get to know that. But uh, if, if I'm not solving the problem the way you would have done it, yeah, well, feel free to comment on the alternatives. But let's not dig into nitpicking here because um, what I will be showing will be sort of solving the issue at hand. So over to code. So the first thing would be a very, very basic scroller. And before I even do that, there are a few things that are sort of handy. If you're fresh to this, um, it's convenient to know a number of things. So I'm using Kick Assembler as I've been showing before, and I'm also using um, uh, Sublime as my text editor. There are a number of things that are implemented in KickAssembler where you would need to solve things in other ways if you're using something else than KickAssembler, but, uh, but I will go through a few of those aspects as well. So one of the things that is implemented in KickAssembler is um, adding like a little basic header. So you implement a little piece of data uh, that conforms to the structure of a basic program. That basic program is just like a line number and a sys address that calls the very first uh, instruction of the program that you add. So, and that one is basic upstart two. And then you feed that with a parameter, which is the, the, the variable or the location of the, uh, of the variable here, which is start in this case. The alternative, and let's see if I can zoom here. So uh, those of you possibly watching this on mobile would, um, and I can also delete a few of the um, the indentation or remove the indentation a bit here. So what you actually are adding here is you add a word that points to the end, sorry, the, the next instruction. Think of, of basic as a, a list where the first two bytes points at the next line of basic code. So this point, I've, gi I've given it the, the variable here or the label um, basic end, bus end. And then there is a word which is, uh, so a, a word would be the, the two bytes in, in low high order which gives the line number. And here you can just feed it with the number 2023, like I've done here, and it will give the line number 2023. And then uh, all the instructions of BASIC are tokenized, which means that they are taken as taken from the textual like syntax and then and then convert it to one byte. So it's sort of a, a, a pseudo format. So it's not actually doing plain text analysis every time. This is a lot faster and, and the, the program is also a lot more, or a lot, but, but at least um, to some extent more efficient because it doesn't need to save the full textual version of, of the commands and also uh, interpreting them is a lot easier because you're interpreting just a, a binary byte rather than first parsing text and converting that to that byte that is done during edit. Uh, and then uh, there is something here uh, which I try to do, which is supposed to be um, 
it's supposed to be a string here, which is what the, the string of the actual address that comes after. And that one is stored as a string. Uh, and for some reason, this didn't work. Um, I've asked Mads, who's doing kick assembler, why this doesn't work. But uh, because uh, if I look at his uh, the actual macro, it looks like he's using just that. So we can, I mean, this is all commented out, so it won't matter any anyhow. But but I'm I'm having two alternatives of this part of the of the code as well. So here I just implemented the text 2061, which is. Uh, the address 08 OD, but but this is sort of hard coded, and I prefer not to have stuff hard coded. If I move things around, I would like the the code to adopt to what I've done. So um, it's it's a bit ugly to implement it like this. Just adding uh, the the text string here 2061. You should have it like this, so it adapts. So if I move things around, that would also always assemble correct. And then I add three bytes in the in the end here, uh, which is terminating the basic program. Uh, quite formally, it's it's not super perfect. If if the nitpicking part here would be that uh, the first zero is is actually sort of terminating the the basic row, and then the next two would be terminating the. Uh, the basic program, so it, bus bus end pointing to this. Oh, it should be like that. Should have two zeros terminating. So I don't. I actually think I can skip the last zero because I'm sort of reusing the uh, the first zero here. But uh, just to be on the safe side, here I have three zeros, and that should always work. Okay, and then uh, the thing I'm doing first is setting up a roster interrupt. So. Again, uh, if you haven't watched the videos before, let's let's just iterate on what a, what an interrupt is. There are a number of functions inside the Commodore 64 that can trigger an interrupt. It's basically raising your hand saying, I have something I urgently need to do. And then the PC, uh, or sorry, the CPU is saying, okay, you need to do that. I will just sort of finish what we are doing here, pausing that. I'll give you control, and when you're done, hand back the control to me, and then I will have the original program resume where it was. And, and the original program wouldn't like be able to tell that uh, it was interrupted, because it will be totally uh, invisible to that like running process. Um, and and the, the you could have timer source. So the timer chips, the two CIA chips, they are... are the key trigger. If you're just running standard basic, the timer are triggering on a on a on an even interval. And when it does that, it's doing stuff like servicing the keyboard and stuff like that. So if you turn off the interrupt, the C64 would stop receiving command or or types from the keyboard. That's one of the things you would men like mention or notice first. Uh, but you also have the the VIC, the uh, the video chip, uh, also being able to give uh, doing that. I would like to to service my interrupt, please. Can I have the control, please? So, first of all, because we're messing with interrupt, it's it's quite handy to do set interrupt. That tells the CPU that you shouldn't service interrupts now. Just just keep on doing what you're doing, and uh, but don't allow any interrupt to to uh, interrupt what i'm doing now because uh, i mean if you're setting up interrupts and an interrupt happens in the middle of that process things could be really funky and we don't want that so we we set an interrupt or you forbid interrupts from happening during uh, the period until we do a cli you clear the interrupt flag and then one of the things we really want to do if we're going to have a roster interrupt, which is what we're going to have here, is that you would like to turn off the potential interrupts from the timer ships. And you do that by setting 7F in DCOD and DDOD. And here, I mean, if you want to be really formal, you could possibly have an LDA 7F, store it in DCOD, and then you do LDA 7F and store it in DDOD. But since the accumulator is already there with CF, uh, 7F, you can store it twice. Of course, you can do that. That's sort of the, 
very low hanging fruit optimization of your code. And then we would like to set up the Vic so that Vic, Vic has this uh, raster interrupt that triggers uh, when we want it to trigger. And you do that by setting O1 in DO1A. That's the interrupt control register inside the Vic. So this is setting raster interrupt. And, and if you would like to set up like collision interrupts from sprites colliding with other sprites and colliding with background, you need to add an additional sources here. But then your interrupt service routine would need to discriminate between what actually caused the interrupt. Here, uh, the interrupt re request would only come from one single source, it's raster interrupts, and there is no other uh, no other source that can happen because we just turned off the, uh, the CIA here. And if there is a pending interrupt from Vic already, we would like to clear that to ensure that new interrupts could happen. And what you should do then is basically store something to DO19. Uh, and a very handy and fast way of doing it is doing like uh, an LSR or an ASL or a ROAR or, or one of the other... Uh, one of the other... Um, instructions uh, that basically does a load and then storing something back. It doesn't really matter what you store. So this works fine. Even if it looks totally weird, it's proven to work. So just, just use this and you will be fine. We also would like to... Oh, wrong here. We also need to set on which row of the screen should the raster interrupt tr trigger. So we are drawing the screen line by line, line by line. Think of it like a dot matrix printer that's printing the screen. And when it's done at the very end of the screen, it starts printing the next screen. So what you would like to do now is ensure that the CPU is interrupted and an interrupt is triggered when it's drawing one particular line. And here I picked F2 and you will see why I picked F2. Uh, there are more than 256 lines on the screen, so uh, if you would like to trigger it uh, on, on, a, on a raster row that is higher than what could be actually fitted in DO12, you need to set the high bit of DO11. So DO11 is also uh, part of setting the interrupt here. So what I'm doing here is I'm loading DO11 and then I'm clearing the top bit, so bit number 7, because that is sort of the most significant bit of the, um, the, the line number that I'm populating for my raster interrupt. And then I'm storing it back to DO11. So, he, so I'm, I'm clearing bit 7, but I'm not touching any of the other bits. They are as they were when I read it. Okay, and so from a hardware perspective, um, the interrupt is triggered and that's sort of hardware using the six last bytes of memory. Um, and, and one is for, for if you're hitting a BRK, a break instruction. One is if you have a non-maskable interrupt, that is part of, of what the CA is doing, and one is doing the IRQ. Uh, but but um, if we have kernel switched in, so if the C64 core OS, you could say, is switched in, that one is taking the interrupt, is doing all the pushing of the CPU registers to the stack, and then handing over um, to, to service that uh, interrupt from... Uh, from a standard routine, but that standard routine is called using a vector, which is the vector at 0314 uh, and 15. So if you would like to hijack that vector, that's how you do it. You populate uh, 0314 and 0315 with the address of your own routine. So here I take the low byte of, uh, of a label IRQ, which is where my IRQ service routine is. And then I take the high byte and do and store that on 0315. Now I've done everything I should, and I call and I do a CLI, which means that okay, now I allow interrupts to happen again. And then I do an RTS. That means that I'm actually returning to basic. So my interrupt will run in the background 
but I can still use use the computer as normal. Um, if I start writing basic code, it will start overwriting my IRQ. So I couldn't really do that. But but if I just move the IRQ routine to somewhere else, uh, I, I could code basic and, and run my basic programs and that would be absolutely fine. But I'll show you that. Uh, what you normally do in a demo, you have something like a, a jump star minus three, which means that you're basically looping like that uh, because the IRQ is doing everything. And what you do, like um, what the machine keeps doing is not relevant. You could just because the IRQ is doing all of the, uh, the actual execution here. OK, so now my IRQ routine. So setting up the IRQ, now the IRQ will happen. What the first thing it will do is increase DO20. And, and the only way, the only reason for doing that is when you're doing like debug coding, because changing the border color is a very concrete way of, of so you can see what happens by, by showing something on the screen. It's a lot easier than having a debug or anything running in the background. That shows you immediately if things are working or not. And then I just have a dummy loop here. So uh, it, it takes FF uh, and I'm doing a NOP here, a no operation, and then I decrement the X and then I'm doing a branch back to the exclamation mark. And, and I should also explain the exclamation mark here. So if you need, rather than finding silly label names here, you can set the exclamation mark. Uh, and the exclamation mark here, so, so when I'm doing the branch here, I'm doing uh, to the previous exclamation mark. So you can have like hundreds of them in your code. Uh, just, just ensure that you are jumping to the proper one. It's, it's quite easy here to start inserting new additional code and add a new exclamation mark somewhere. And then suddenly that branch will no longer point to the relevant exclamation mark. But but if you're having something very small like, like this, the exclamation mark again would be a kick assembler uh, solution. There might be other like similar implementations in other assemblers, but but in order not to be able to or be forced to write silly label names, then then this is really handy of cutting down on that tedious task. And then I'm dec decrementing the O20, so uh, decrementing the border color. Doing a clear of DO19, DO19, that means that I'm preparing the computer for the next interrupt. And then I'm jumping to EA31. And EA31 is what uh, 0314 and 0315 is originally pointing to. So I'm basically hijacking the vector, doing my little thing, and then let it do whatever it's doing uh, on a normal interrupt. So just keep doing that. Uh, just, just showing uh, the other address, EA81 is uh, another let's say the latter part of the interrupt service routine. If you just want to kind of uh, end uh, an interrupt, you can jump to EA81 and use the, the kernel's implementation of ending an interrupt uh, without having to write that code for yourself. Um, you are bypassing stuff like servicing the keyboard, so it will just sort of end the interrupt. It won't do anything else. Okay. And that was it. Let's run that. So I've set stuff to generate uh, a D64 and, and then I run it from there. So what you see here now is that I increment the O20 here and then I decrement it here. So here is my delay loop. That's what's happening. And as you can see, I still have my cursor. So because I was doing an RTS, I was I was exiting my program. And uh, let's do print hello world. So you see, basic still runs, and and I can still do that. But if I start writing a basic program now, it will overwrite stuff and my code where I'm servicing the interrupt will eventually be overwritten. And when I trigger an interrupt and my, my interrupt service routine is overwritten, mayhem will, of course, happen. So this was the first setting up the raster interrupt and, and like the setting up also uh, a convenient basic start. That's also um, 
a good step for you to sort of have control over because then then running your program would be a lot easier than having to load it manually and then sissing that's taken care of you by that so let's have a look at uh, a scroller then okay the next part here would be uh the scroller then and a few of the things that uh, you saw in the previous segment would be still here I built on the on the previous code and just added a bit more for for executing the scroller. Okay, so first of all, so what a scroller is? It's it's having a text that floats, and this is a one line text scroller. So I have text running from the left, from the right to the left, sorry, and uh, and it will be totally fluent. It will pus it will move. Uh, one pixel to the left uh, for every uh, raster interrupt. So it, it will move basically uh, 60 pixels per second, or uh, no, sorry, 50 because we're in PAL country. It would flow 60 in uh, in NTSC land. Okay, so uh, and and I'm using the lowest uh, the lowest character line, and I define the starting point here because again, one of the things I tend to do when I code, I want as little as possible to be hard coded because I don't want uh, stuff to so, sort of have ne negative start uh, side effects if I start moving things around, or if I suddenly want to move or or scroll the first line of the screen uh, i could i could easily change it by uh, by just changing this value so 07 c0 is the hexadecimal uh, address for the lowest left corner of the standard screen the standard screen is from 0400 to 07 e7 or e8 depend also oh, it's it's actually o three e8 bytes which means that the last byte is 07 e7 um so here here you have that that is sort of the the first on the left corner we went through setting up the raster interrupt so i haven't done anything else here uh oh my spelling here and uh, yeah, I didn't change the comments here. So I'm, I'm triggering the interrupt here on now on address F1. So um, I'll, yeah, I'll show you why that is done like that. Uh, the vector here is, is sort of the same, uh, setting up that. I'm doing a few things here that you might want to learn. First of all, I'm setting the pointers to uh, point to my scroller. Uh, let's see, let's, I'll, I'll scroll here so you see what that is doing. This one is doing that, set scroller. So it's taking the low byte of the variable scroll text or the label scroll text and store that in address FE and then the high um, the high byte here and storing that in FF. So when, when this these four lines or five including the RTS have run, I have a pointer in the zero page that points to the first address in my scroll text. And I have my scroll text here. This is a scroller that works uh, that will show how raster interrupts work. And I'm also doing this thing, uh, screen code mixed. Um, you could set um, kick assembler to interpret uh, or uh, implement strings into the memory, assuming they are either Petsky or that they are screen codes. I do have a special episode on, on Petsky and, and the difference between Petsky and screen code. So I won't go through that, but, but if, if you have like standard text, you would like it at Pets, at Petsky, but if you want to Cop and and that is sort of a, a format where you should take the character and use a print routine to print it to the screen. Screen code is the actual code that ha that ends up on the screen after you have run the Petsky through the actual print routine. So if you would like to poke it directly to the screen, you should have screen code. And then you have like two modes. You have mixed, which is lowercase and uppercase. And then you have um, upper, yeah, 
screen code and, uh, dash upper is the other one. Uh, and, and that one would be uh, when you have um, the uppercase and graphics format. So, um, so this one is ensuring that I would have upper and lower uh, um, and it's, it's in screen code format. All right, let's go back to where we were. So that was the set scroller. That was setting the, um, the zero page pointer to the start of the scroll text. And then I'm doing a bit of Voodoo stuff here. Uh, I'm, I'm FFD2 is the print routine. So I'm taking OE and print that. And then I'm taking O8 and I'm printing that. So that is setting the upper lower, this toggling between upper lower and upper graphics. I'm setting that to upper lower and I'm locking it so you cannot change it by pressing keys on the keyboard. Uh, it would be really weird if you could do that. So, uh, and then I'm uh, again returning to um, to basic here. My interrupt is now a little bit different, so I'm increasing the O20 still because uh, that's what you normally do in your sort of when you are developing for for seeing what happens on your screen. I'm taking DO16, which is one of the control values. It has the lowest three bits sets the the scrolling of the of the screen in that direction. The uh, bit so that would be bit zero, one, and two. Bit three is setting the uh, or, or toggling between 38 and 40 column mode. Normally it's in 40 where the bit is set and but here we would like to shrink the border to hide that little waggling of the 8-bit waggling that you can do using the soft scroll register. So, uh, uh, so that is why I'm deleting. So th the first three you can't really see the highlight here, or at least I can't on my screen. So this is the scroll register. Uh, and this this bit here is the 38 column mode uh, that we were deleting. So you are taking the 016, you're zeroing out the low nibble, the low four bits. And then you're adding something which is fine scroll. I'll show you that in a second. And then you're storing back that to DO16. And fine scroll is a value which I allow to travel between 0 and 7. Uh, and then that is populated in these three bits. So that is what actually then sets the fine scroll register to where the screen is going to be positioned. Again, I needed my delay loop to ensure that uh, the raster interrupt is traveling until the end of the screen. This is where I init the DO19 again. So setting up for the next interrupt and then decrementing DO20. So again, back to normal background color. And then I'm also, uh, and formally, I guess this should be on uh yeah mm -hmm. yeah oh that was actually very wrong uh i should do sorry yeah putting on the fly here just to ensure that it looks more more nice uh so what i'm doing here now is setting uh c8 to D uh, to do 16 that is setting back like a default value of do 16 so setting back the 40 column mode and normal scroll registers because uh, if i don't set do 16 to something like standard the entire screen would be wiggling like that and and that is something we don't want we want the top 24 lines to be still and we're just moving the last 25th line. Fine scroll was this uh, register uh, or this value uh, of the fine scroll if I want. So I'm moving it from seven to six to five and then all the way down to zero. And when it's zero, I, I would need to, if I want to move the entire set of characters one pixel to the left, there is no fine scroll register I can play with, so I need to set it back to seven and then move all the characters one step to, step to the left. So th this is what we will see happening here. So we decrement the fine scroll 
and unless that decrement goes to uh, to FF, if it was zero and it, you decrement it again, it will be FF. And that's a situation we don't want. We want, if that happens, we should set the scroll register back to seven and then move all of the characters. So what happens, so decrement fine scroll, if we just decremented between seven and, and, and zero, we are good. We don't need to do anything else. That was everything we needed for this frame. But if it was zero and you decremented it to FF, we need to set the fine scroll register back to seven and then move all of the characters. So I'm storing seven in fine scroll and then I'm uh, jump subroutine to do scroll, move the entire set of characters. The entire line needs to go one step to the left. And then I will need to pick the current uh, value of the, of the scroller and populate that in the very like lower right corner. That is a new character that would appear because uh, you, the, the, the course scroll here skips the first character. That one is overwritten by the one that was before. And then like in a queue, one is being serviced. So you, you out of you, and then you bring a new guy in from the right here. So that is what do scroll is doing. And let's, let's look at that uh, when I scroll further here. Uh, yeah, service the interrupt, decrement the O20, and then co call uh, or jump back to the general service routine here. So what do, do scroll is doing here, so I'm setting Y to zero, and then I take the second byte and I place it at the first byte. So that is what's happening here. The row was the variable we set in the beginning, so that one is 07C0 plus one, so it's 07C1, store that in 07C0, bang. Okay, but that's not all. We should do this for all the characters on the, on the line. So we increment Y and then we loop that. So you move the characters like one step to the left until you've moved all of them. And that will be 27, hex 27 characters. When we've done that, there is suddenly like the last one is now this, this you move the, the, uh, the one from, from last to the second last, and then we need to place a new guy at the very end. So, and, and luckily we have set up a pointer to point to where we are in the, uh, in the scroll text. So we load Y with zero again, and that's just because we have to do it like that. Um, and then we load from that pointer, comma y. We store it to the very last position, so um, 07z0 plus 27. Uh, but what, what I've also done here is that, yeah, you should possibly also speed it up a bit, like doing that. So if I read that character, and that one is a zero, uh, then something is, is, uh, no. Ah, yeah, let, let's keep it like that because I know that works. Uh, so if, if I read a zero, I've, I've reached the end of my scroll text and I need my scroll text to, uh, wrap around and start from the beginning again. So, so if the, Branch or not equal here means that the character I just stored in the, um, or, or I just read from the scroller was something else than zero, then, then we were all good. I didn't reach the end of my scroll text. But if I reach the end of my scroll text, this would be zero. And then I should set the scroller, which means that uh, I'm, I'm resetting the pointers in zero page. And then I'm reading that value again, because now I should read it from the first position of the scroller. All done. Uh, the next thing would be that I need to increment the pointers to ensure that it now, the next lap around, it will read from the next character of the scroll text and then from the next and the next and the next. So I'm incrementing FE. I'm loading FE to ensure that it didn't wrap into zero, but if it wrapped to the zero, I should increment FF, so the high byte. 
and we're good. So this would in, uh, this would allow you to have a scroll text which is lo longer than 256 bytes. If you had a, a, a scroll text that would be only 256 bytes, you could play with uh, the Y register here uh, and just uh, just do it like that. You wouldn't need to kind of work with the pointer that where you increase the actual pointer. And here you see the set scroller. That's still the same as we saw before and. And uh, yeah, there is a little little extra thing here. Uh, the fine scroll register, I start that with eight. Um, you can say that is a bit ugly because what happens here is that um, when I decrement fine scroll, it, sh it should start with seven. So it's so setting it to eight, it's basically a value which I couldn't have inside my program, but I'm but given the way I've imp implemented here, uh, because the decrement here happens first, you would have seven when you start the loop, which means that, and that is a legit value here. So it, it's all fine. And it, it's just setting up everything. Uh, so it, it's, it's set up nicely so the loop can start. Uh, I hope that was sort of understandable. And let's run it. So what you see here down here is now a scroll text, which is flowing nicely. Uh, yeah, I'm not saying this is very nicely. Yeah, sorry about the the bars and, and all of that. It, uh, the, uh, I guess my vice screen is set up really weirdly. So the scroller flows super nicely down here on the very last row you could see that the columns are less than the screen above uh, so that's that's how the switch to um, to 38 column mode rather than 40 column mode um, that's how that manifests and you can also see the gray bar going like that and that is so the, the roster time that this takes, most of the roster time is actually taken by this delay loop. So, but, but you would have like the additional uh, flip-flopping here is when it's doing the course scrolling, it takes more raster time. Normally it's just decrementing the scroll register and then it's handing back to the normal raster interrupt. Where here, it, it's um, like every eighth frame, it will be needing more raster time and you would see that flip-flopping. And again, if you are coding, it's key to ensure that you're not trying to consume more CPU cycles per frame than you actually have available. Because if you try to do that, then you would have a roster overlap and you would have the, the next roster interrupt uh, coming in before you actually kind of done all the stuff you wanted to do on the previous roster interrupt. And eventually you will run out. It's like having more tasks than you have available time. And, and eventually you will panic and, and uh, yeah, you will need to have sick leave. And we don't want our CPU to have sick leaves. We couldn't have that. So please ensure you have ro enough roster interrupt and this increase in the O20 and then decrease the O20 is a, a, a really good way of actually finding out how much your stuff is consuming. And as you can see, it's flowing nicely and, and I can also totally corrupt it by, by doing like this. The, the, it's still running, so I can I can write that. Yeah, if you want to play with it, uh, and uh, if you want to allow that or disallow that, we will be just not doing the RTS in the beginning to ensure that uh, you don't get control back and you don't have the cursor back. Yeah, so if you do uh, your own code, of course you won't hand back so that the user can do any sort of input other than like pressing space or whatever you like the user to do. But that is a nicely flowing character scrolling using default font. Yeah, and it's rather efficient as well. There are, I mean, there are poss possibly other ways of doing it, but but I think this is rather efficient and small for uh, solving the, the issue of implementing a character scroller. Okay, yeah, I coded a little bit more and I'm ready to share that with you. And uh, a lot of it, uh, the initial parts would be the same, but uh, 
um, quite a lot in, is new. So let's go over to what we have here. And of course, those of you watching with mobile want to be, have a screen that shows bigger characters. So I hope you can see it even if you're watching this on a mobile. Basic start and setting up the roster interrupt. Everything is the same. I didn't change anything there. Um, what I change here is, uh, this is a little copy loop. It takes from a variable or a label called sprite and it copies that to the hard-coded address of 0340. So if you look at the C64 memory map, when you load from tape, the, the tape buffer is from 0334, I believe. Uh, up until 0400. So there is room for, what is that, like uh, three sprites. If you want to have like only a few sprites and if you're doing examples such as this one, that's one of the places where you can easily copy them and uh, and they would be displayed fine. Uh, so I copy to 0340. Would I, if I need more sprites, I would have uh, then 0380, 03C0. That would be the other places for like temporary sprites where you, if you just want to do like example code. Uh, yeah, so that is copying the 3F bytes of the sprite. And then I need to set the sprite pointer. So the Vic needs to know where to find the data that is the sprite. Uh, and the sprite pointers are, uh, well, you have one kilobyte of memory reserved for the sprite, uh, for, for the screen, but the screen is only using uh, 03E8 bytes of those, which means that you have hex 18 bytes in the end that are free. And the last eight of them are, uh, are references to the current sprite, so sprite pointers. So basically you do have a 10, hex 10 bytes free there in between but but uh, it's it's there where you find it and uh, um, I, I guess it could be both a pro and con that if you change where this where the screen is you also change where the sprites are and i'm sure a number of demo effects use that extensively so you can change all the pointers at one time by just changing one screen pointer convenient um, yeah probably a bit above where we are with this example uh, yeah, and then uh, I set 0, 01 to DO15. Again, this is sprites in it, sprite in it, so it's it's enabling sprite number zero, so the lowest sprites. Bit zero is then set to one, and then that sprite is enabled. And then I uh, I use the X and Y coordinates for the sprite. I set that to 70 because that's sort of a random place in the middle of the screen. And again, it's good, for example, just to place it somewhere so you can see it. Uh, normally, you should ensure that you are setting the sprites according to your wishes, like uh, priority in relation to background. Uh, you do want them to hi be high res or multicolor, but uh, uh, since I will launch this on a kind of reset machine, I, I know what the values are and I don't need to change them. But, but again, if you are using this in your own code, you should state all the relevant parts. You shouldn't assume that they are in a given condition. But this is just to keep the example a bit shorter. Uh, I haven't added more. And then CLI and RTS, so we will still get back to basic. Uh, yeah, um, yeah, this is pos possibly uh, stretching a bit over the target as well, but uh, again, I'm, I'm doing this as I've done all the time, increasing DO20 so you know where the roster is triggering, and then deck DO20 to know when the, uh, the roster is hand uh, my raster service routine is handing back control to the CPU. I'm picking this value, which is the Y coordinate of the... Uh, um, yeah, the, the, the Y position of uh, the sprite. And I am shifting that three times, so I'm multiplying with eight and then storing it in color. So this way, if, if we're moving the sprite up and down, it will change color per eight lines. Uh, that, that's just a quick way to get some sort of effect that you would see what happens. Um, yeah. I'm loading from Joyport and uh, I define that as a variable in the very top. So I'm reading from DZ00 um, and I'm checking the lowest bit, uh, bit zero. Uh, if that is not set to, so if that is, 
uh, branch if not equal. So, I mean, if it's not equal to zero, that means it's set to one, which means that you have pressed the joystick up. And if you press joystick up, you should decrease the Y register of the of the position. So, uh, and then you do the same for down, but then you increase down, and then you should have bit, what is that, like one, two, and uh, bit two, and then you should decrease uh, D1000, and then if you want it to go right, you should increase it. And then I've also added, uh, if you press the joystick button, I've, I've load, I'm have i loading one of the uh, expansion uh, registers. I think it's in that direction. If that is set, I'm flipping it. So I'm reading it, flipping it, and then storing it back. So whenever I press the, the joystick button, it will expand and get back to normal. Expand, get back to normal. Yeah, and then the end of the uh, interrupt service request here. I have defined a sprite, and if you're good enough, you can see what I've written, but it will be quite clear when we show the sprite on the screen. Yes, so that is the sprite. Uh, yeah. There you have all the pixels, I guess. Okay, let's run it. Oops, that was really ugly. Let's do it like that. Ah, there you have it. That is the sprite. It's placed there. And you can still do list and you can still do uh, print uh, whatever. But as, uh, as the interrupt is running, what you can do is you can use the joystick now to control the positioning of that sprite. And if you move it down, you see that it changes color. And if you move it up, it changes color. Whereas if you move it right and left, it will not change color. V very, very easy to get kind of effect that color change, but oh, yeah, and we should do that. So I pressed it. And it expanded both in X and Y direction. And now I will rink it again. Oh. To be honest, it's, it's a rather shitty game. You have one sprite and there is no points and you can run it around the screen. But uh, just to show you that just in a few lines of code, we can have something running and then the uh, handling of that main sprite takes place in the background and you don't need to worry about that in the main loop. Uh, that is taken, ca ca taken care of by a service interrupt. Hmm. Yeah, getting to like this game. Graphics is good. I'll give it five out of five for graphics. Watching the previous recording, I realized that there is one additional or a few additional things I would like to mention around sprites. First of all, um, if you have an interrupt that latches on a particular place on the screen, that means that if you're when you're doing writes and you're changing writes to uh, registers, Vic registers, those some of those changes will have the immediate effect, and some will sort of only be yeah imposed on on like a later state after something else has done so that might sound crazy but but uh, thing like moving a sprite up and down um, you can only do that if you if you change the direct uh, the the position of a sprite uh, like upward or downwards it will not like immediately move only after you you have drawn the sprite um, and the sprite isn't visible, then you can change position and it will appear wherever you change it. That's sort of the basis for multiplexers. So if I move a sprite up and down and I change the position up and down in the middle of that, that sprite being drawn by the raster, nothing will actually happen. But if I move it sideways, it will happen. And I, and I will show you why, what that looks like. Um, so here you have the FLT logo there. So if you see here, the, the raster interrupt is latched on row F1 or whatever I set it to. 
and that is also where I update the sprite pointers when I when I have sort of feedback from the joystick. And you see, I don't know if you can see it uh, if, if you're watching a mobile, but do watch this on a PC or, or something with a bigger screen and then you will see it quite clearly. You have a tearing effect here so that the first portion of the sprite is plotted in one like location and then the uh, the lower part is move is sort of not following it's not attached to the top part it's 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 one pixel left or right when i'm moving <clears throat> and that is of course that the other part that i didn't mention was that you can have sprite positions that uh, that are more than 256 so there is in in that direction you can have a sprite, sprite position that would be like 110 and and uh, and the reason for that is that the sprite is uh, the screen is wide enough to have more than 256 position. You need to have um, a position that is bigger than that, and you achieve that by setting a bit in DO10. But I didn't do that. I just had a plane increment when you move right, which means that when you go to position 255 or FF in hexadecimal, it will wrap around and start on on position zero. And you will see that here, if I move right, then you see, whoops, it just, it didn't go to the full extent on the sprite, uh, sorry, on the screen, the very right side of the screen, because then it sort of appeared on the left again. I can go the other way around and you would have the same effect here. So it, it, it can only go for to position 255, the way my example is written. So what you should do, if you want the sprite to not wrap around like that if that's not what you want then you need to either block it from going beyond uh, position 255 or wherever your like rightmost perimeter is or you need to ensure that if you have 255 and then you want it to go to like position 256 or hex 100 then you need to handle do 10 the bit in do 10 as well it's not a big thing, but but you have to make sure that you're sort of supporting that. Uh, and also, um, I mean, here, if you don't want the tearing effect, just set the raster interrupt outside of the screen. As long as you ensure that you have like sufficient number of cycles to service your interrupt, uh, then you can have it anywhere. And um, yeah, just ensure that when you're updating something at the same time as the raster, is moving things could look rather crappy and you have to ensure that that doesn't happen um, that's you as a coder your responsibility yeah those were the two small additional things i would like to just wanted to add okay that was basically what i wanted to cover today um i think this is more than enough for one episode uh and just so you don't have, need to type everything in again and uh, get like one little thing wrong and then need to ask me why is does why it doesn't work for you then i provided the source code and i don't know if you're into git but uh, i store my stuff on gitlab so you see here there is a, a public repository here called Fairlight TV demo code. Um, that a link to that will also be in the description here, so I'll copy that and make sure that you have that available. Uh, yeah, so that was everything for today. I hope you enjoyed this uh, little crash course in roster interrupts and um, what you can do with that and also uh, the scroller and the sprite steering thing. Let's, let's see you play with that and see if you can come up with, with anything and let's try to increase your knowledge. You need to invest a lot of time in kind of playing with it. Don't ask anybody, how does this work? Test it. Test it and validate, see what you think and then play with it and change it and, and you would see the effects of what you try and eventually you were learning by doing as Lord Baden Powell once said. I think that's a super nice way of learning but sometimes you need a little kick in the butt and let's see this video as that kick in the butt. Enjoy and welcome next week. Bye bye.